John chapter 20. This is John the Beloved's account of the resurrection, where we find Mary Magdalene found the tomb in which Jesus was laid empty. She ran as fast as she could to publish the news to Peter and the other disciples. Mary said to them that they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not, referring to herself and the other women who were with her, she said, we know not where they have laid him. And so Peter and John ran both together toward the tomb. As you can see, early Sunday morning, there were a lot of running on resurrection morning. And tried to see who'd get there first, John, being the younger of the two, won the race, but he stopped at the mouth of the tomb as soon as he saw a glimpse of the remaining linen cloths used to wrap the body of Jesus. Peter, being the older guy, without stopping, however, like John did, barged into the sepulcher and was also awed at the strange remaining linen cloths. And even, even more remarkable was that the kerchief that was used to wrap Jesus' head was neatly folded and set to the side of linen cloths used to wrap the body of Jesus. What thief would take the time to fold the head covering? But both Peter and John saw enough evidence that Jesus' body was stolen. And they believed Mary's early morning news headline. Scripture tells us that the disciples went away again unto their own home. What is this telling us? It gives us the sense that they were dejected and disappointed and disoriented. Which brings us to verses 11 through 18. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 11 through 18. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Had she been working out? Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. 
Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. That is the word of the Lord. May he bless it. May he bless it indeed. You may be seated. From this text, I want to offer you three biblical responses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our biblical response should be, number one, wonder. Wonder. What is it to wonder? Somebody said it's not easy to convey a sense of wonder, let alone the resurrection wonder to another. It's the very nature of wonder to catch us off guard, to circumvent expectations and assumptions. Wonder can't be packaged and it cannot be worked up. It requires some sense of being there and some sense of engagement, end quote. I know that we are more than 2,000 years removed from the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ, but wonder should still be our biblical response. Why? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? That a dead body could rise. We had a funeral here this week, and we did not see the body rise up. But in this event, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the biblical response should have been wonder. But Mary, as you noticed in our reading today, she wept. The disciples, dejected, disappointed, disoriented, but they did not wonder. They might have wondered about the missing body, but they did not wonder about the resurrection. According to a dictionary, wonder is a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by seeing or experiencing something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. A perfect example of this is found in Luke chapter 8 when Jesus spoke to the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased and the Word of God tells us that there was a great calm and they being afraid and the Word is used by Luke, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this that he would Tell the wind and the raging sea to hush up. And they listened. They were stunned. They experienced something beautiful and unexpected and inexplicable. When was the last time you wondered at the person of Jesus? When was the last time you wondered at God, at the many things that God has done for you? Have you lost the wonder of being a child of God? Do you know from whom we can relearn wonder? From whom can we relearn Wonder. The children, right? The children are a fountain of wonders. Every single one of my children is a wellspring of wonders. 
Several times recently when we go to a park, when there's a lot of grass, I would pick up CJ like this, both of my arms, and I would toss him in the air as high as I could. And I would catch him on the way down like this. And do you know what his expression is? Now, he's not able to speak to me yet, but I could tell from his reaction and his wonderment that he wants me to do it again. Do it again. Do it again, Daddy. Now, suppose I go to my wife and I said, Okay, babe, your turn. <laughs> You're laughing because you know what her reaction would be. She would say, uh-uh, you ain't doing that to me. And you and I as adults don't have that thrill anymore. Don't have that wonder anymore that a child would have at a monotonous event such as flying up in the air for about 12 feet up high. We don't have that thrill anymore. The wonder that you and I as adults is lost. There were at least two wonderful things that should have caused Mary to wonder. First, I want to point to your attention, the angels sitting inside the tomb. Did she realize <laughs> that there were two angels there? It should have caused her to wonder about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to turn your attention to Exodus chapter 25 because I want you to see this. A spectacular Thing that happened here. Exodus chapter 25. What you'll find here in the context of Exodus 25 is the detailed description of the furnitures of the tabernacle, which was the portable place of worship for the people of Israel in the time of Moses. When they were wandering in the wilderness of Zin, they didn't have a church building like we do have now. And this was a big tent. And they called it the tabernacle. And they would pick it up as they marched through the wilderness. So it was a portable sanctuary. And here in Exodus 25, we're given a detailed description of the furnitures that were part of the tabernacle. And the key piece of furniture in the tabernacle was what's called the Ark of the Covenant. It was a rectangular box made out of acacia wood, and overlaid with pure gold, both inside and outside of it. But the lid for the Ark of the Covenant was made entirely out of pure gold. And God called that lid the mercy seat. Why? Because that's where the priest would sprinkle the Blood of the innocent lamb on the lid. All right? Now, we're given further description of that in Exodus 25. I want you to read along with me verses 17 and following. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Roughly, four feet by two feet. Verse 18, And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. What in the world is a cherubim? Well, let's find out. Of beaten work shalt thou make them. 
in the ends of the mercy seat, verse 19, and make one cherub or cherub. Well, we know what a cherub is. It's, a, it's an angel. It's a spirit being. It's an angel. But here, this, these cherubims were made out of gold as well. And you're going to put one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end of the lid. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. Look up here and picture in your mind's eye that my hands here represent the cherubims. One on this end of the lid and the other on this end of the lid. And they are spreading their wings up like this and bowing. In the middle is the mercy seat. Now let's move uh, to verse number 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children. Now, I want you to go back to John 20. Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb of Christ only to find it empty, right? John chapter 20. Verse number 12. And she stooped down to look in. All right? And what does she see, class? Verse 12 says, And seeth two angels in white. And what are they doing? They're sitting. Where are they sitting? The one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus have lain. Did that picture in your mind from Exodus 25 match what we have here in John chapter 20 verse 12? It matches perfectly, doesn't it? This should have been a cause for wonder. The scenario was the perfect fulfillment of the typology of the mercy seat in Exodus 25. Mary should have picked up on that and experienced wonder. A feeling of surprise mingled with admiration. Instead, Mary was depressed. I mean, she didn't even recognize the angels there. She was dejected. She was disappointed. She was disoriented. But listen to this. Let's not be so hard on Mary, okay? Because we would have reacted in the same way too. Well, how do you say that, Pastor Christian? Because you couldn't remember last Lord's Day sermon if I asked you to tell me, would you? Much less what you learned in Sunday school about the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant a year ago. Mary missed it. And if you're honest today, you would have missed it too. And I would have missed it too. But it should have been our response. That is wonder, wonderment. The second items that uh, should have caused wonder are the grave cloths and the kerchief. The piece of cloth that was used to wrap the head of the dead body. The gospel writer John Mark tells us that's that was brand new. It was brand spanking new, and it was made out of fine linen. Both Peter and John saw the linen cloths, get this, in their 
orderly manner. That is, in the manner by which dead bodies are wrapped. They just laid there, but without the body. Author Dwight Pentecost notes this, that the fact that the strips of linen cloth were undisturbed and that the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head was neatly folded up by itself was evidence that the body had not been stolen. Thieves either would have left the burial cloths in disarray in the tomb, listen, or more likely have carried off the body wrapped, leaving no cloths behind. Another commentator exclaims, This is the astounding phenomenon. The linen bands lying. Nothing whatever, nothing whatsoever had been done with them. They were merely lying. They are not to imagine, or we are not to imagine that they had been unwound from the body as was done with the grave bands of Lazarus when he came to life. Neither had they been cut or stripped off in some other way. They lay just as they had been wound about the limbs and the body. Only the body was no longer in them, and thus the wrappings just lay flat. That would have been a cause for wonderment. But Mary didn't notice that like John and Peter did. So Mary Magdalene missed that too and continued to weep. How about you, my friends? Are your powers of observation, your scientific mind able to notice that and wonder at the facts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Will you wonder at the resurrection? That's the first response. Secondly, the second biblical response to the resurrection should be worship. Worship. Look at verses 15 and 17 of our text. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 15 through 17. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Behind the tears, Mary could not see clearly who it was who spoke to her and deafened by her own wailing. The Greek word here behind her weeping is that she was actually just wailing. She could not hear clearly the voice of the Master. And yet, still under the impression that Jesus' body was stolen, she asked the question, where did they take it to? And in her disoriented mind, her disoriented state, promised that she could carry Jesus' body all by herself, just as soon as the gardener could tell her the exact location but as soon as Jesus could get a word in the midst of Mary's emotional display, Mary realized instantly that it was Jesus. Notice that she didn't think it was a ghost, nor did she act like it was an apparition or a dream. She exclaimed unto him, and her exclamation was, Rabboni which is to say, Master, or my dear teacher. This finally was her expression of wonderment. And at this moment, she experienced the feeling of surprise, mingled with admiration and delight. And at this same exact moment, I would contend that her wonderment 
turned immediately to the second biblical response that we're talking about, and that is what? Worship. Worship. Notice verse number 17, that Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. Meaning, Mary immediately fell prostrate before Jesus and grabbing and clinging to his feet. Now that was the ancient way of giving homage, giving respect to a dignitary like a king of the ancient Near East. But I'm willing to argue with you that Mary was doing more than that. She was not doing just an homage or obeisance or a public special honor to a dignitary like a king. But what Mary did here was worship. Look at Matthew 28. I want you to see this. We looked at this this morning as our brother read the scripture this morning in Matthew 28. This is what I mean by this response in the account given to us by Matthew. We're told that the women who came to the tomb early Sunday morning to complete the embalming of Jesus' body, these women were told by the angel that Jesus wasn't there, for he is risen. Look at verses 7 through 9. Matthew 28, 7 through 9. Say amen when you get there. And go quickly, the angels told them, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Uh, these women, um, excepting Mary Magdalene, they, they wondered. They had fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. There's another running here. Lots, lots of running on resurrection morning. Verse number 9, look at this. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them and said, All hail. And they did what? They came and held him by the feet and did what, class? Worshipped him. Worshipped him. Can you see what I was talking about? That's what a biblical response to the resurrection look like. Are you doing that? Worship is the reverential response of creation, human or otherwise, to the all-encompassing magnificence of God. Do you respond in a reverential awe to the all-encompassing magnificence of God? William Temple once said, Worship is the nourishment of the mind upon God's truth. Worship is the quickening of the conscience by God's holiness. Worship is the cleansing of the imagination by God's beauty. Worship is the response of my life to God's plan for my life. Christian, when you worship, your mind is nourished by God's truth. When you worship, your conscience is awakened to the holiness of God. Your imagination is cleansed by the splendid beauty of God. Do you respond like that to the fact of the resurrection of Jesus? Turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, that night of the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the ten apostles. Thomas, for some reason, was not in the group. 
Jesus, in a most spectacular display of supernatural power, suddenly appeared in the midst of the apostles where the doors were shut. Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you, because they were afraid. They were hiding from the Jewish authorities. They were hiding for their own lives. But Jesus appeared <laughs> right in the midst of them. Jesus showed them his hands and his side. And you can imagine that the wounds probably were still fresh. It's only three days old, counting the day he died. He showed it to them. You imagine the wonderment that they experienced, the surprise and the delight, this unexpected event taking place. But Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. Look at verses 24 through 28. John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And a week had gone by. Verse 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas finally was with them. Then came Jesus. Again, the doors were shut, and Jesus just appeared right in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And here is Thomas' response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what is that? In verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, What? My Lord and my God. That, my friends, is a most appropriate response to the resurrection. Thomas called him, My Lord and my God. You see the sense of worship. No wonder why the Apostle Paul records this for us. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Lord. To the glory of God the Father. This, to us, is also the highest designation of the Son of God. When you and I call Him my Lord and my God, an appropriate, a most appropriate response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus received Thomas's worship. Will you worship Jesus in the same way? The biblical responses to the resurrection, number one, wonder. Number two, worship. And number three, and finally, it is witness. Witness. Go back to our text in Matt, uh, John. John chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. John chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But what? Go to my brethren. And what? Say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God. And your God. And what did Mary do? Verse number 18. Mary Magdalene came 
and witnessed. She told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Mary Magdalene witnessed. Witnessed. Will you also witness, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Will you witness like Mary did? Have you been born again? Have you received eternal life? Is your life changed by the gospel? Is your life changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Then you are to be a witness. You are to be a witness. You should go, therefore, and teach all nations about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Tell others what you've experienced. Tell others of your wonderment. Tell others of your worship of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Proclaim that you were a sinner, a rebel against your Maker, an enemy of God. You've sinned against a holy God and would have been justly punished and condemned. But tell people this, that God demonstrated His love toward you in that while you were yet a sinner... God sent His only Son in the person of Jesus Christ and He died for your sins. He lived a perfect life which you could not live. And He died as your substitute on the cross. The Apostle Peter tells us that He, in fact, bore our sins in His body on the tree. And God's wrath was satisfied. He absorbed the wrath of God, which was to fall upon you. And tell people this. Oh, he saved me. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That is your witness, ladies and gentlemen. That is your witness. Will you witness? Will you wonder? At the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Will you worship Jesus Christ because of his resurrection? Will you witness? By the way, proclaim is all that Jesus asks. You're not responsible if the people don't believe in your proclamation. You understand that? Our duty is to witness. Just proclaim it. Will you be a witness today? For that is the biblical response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, take the time to wonder. Take the time today to worship and take the opportunities to witness for the resurrection of Jesus Christ.